and I'll give it a couple of seconds after it starts. All right. I see people trickling in. Hello, everyone. All right, welcome to the Neuroblastoma Parent Global Symposium. My name is Kyle Matthews. I'm the Executive Director of the Bee Childhood Cancer Foundation, and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, this session is DFMO Studies at the Bee Childhood Cancer Research Consortium, and it's being delivered by a friend of mine, Dr. Javier Osterheld, who is the Division Chief and Jeff Gordon Children's Foundation Endowed Chair of the Levine Children's Cancer and Blood Disorders Program at Levine Children's Hospital Atrium Health in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, before I hand it over to Dr. Osterhell, I do want to draw your attention to the Q&A button, which will be at the bottom of your screen. And that's how you can submit questions during the session uh, for Dr. Osterhell to address at the end. If the button's not showing up, you might need to kind of hover your cursor or tap, uh, and then you'll see those uh, buttons across the bottom, and the Q&A one is usually on the right. If you see a question in the Q&As that you like, you can give it a thumbs up to move it up the list. And uh, when Dr. Osterhold is finished with the presentation, we'll be answering the ones that have the most thumbs up uh, sort of in that order. So that'll let us know if those are ones that you would like to see answered. Um, all right, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Osterhold. Uh, thank you, Kyle, I really appreciate that. Is that sharing the screen? Hello? Uh, I did not see the screen yet, no. Okay. We had it up, technical difficulties, we will get it. You just want to mouse over and hit that share screen button. It should be in green, at least on mine it is. It is on mine too. And let me uh, I apologize, everyone. All right, that should there be it. Go. Yep, Perfect. I see it now. All right. Wonderful. All right, thank you everybody. I apologize for uh, that technical difficulty. Um, I just wanted to thank the organizers uh, for allowing me to speak on behalf of the Beach Childhood Cancer Research Consortium um, about DFMO treatment for high-risk neuroblastoma. As Kyle so uh, eloquently introduced myself, I am a, uh, uh, the division chief at Levine Children's Hospital in Charlotte, North Carolina. And since I am speaking to a few parents, um, I am the father of two boys, a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old. and um, a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Puerto Rico, been uh, married for almost 20 years now and been down in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina for about 18 years. Um, really excited uh, to be able to give this lecture today. Um, to talk about the Beach Childhood Cancer Consortium, it's been an incredibly big year uh, for the consortium because it has moved. Um, it was um, at Spectrum Health, Helen DeVos Children's Hospital for uh, the last decade and is now um, at LCH, uh, Dr. Schiller and her team uh, moved in July of 2020 during the uh, COVID pandemic, which added a bit of stress. Um, as you can see there on the, on the globe, it is uh, 42 hospitals in the United States, seven hospitals in Canada, and one hospital in Lebanon. Uh, this consortium has continued to go um, over the last really four or five years, really taking off and adding new studies and new members and uh, really delving into the science of neuroblastoma and some other uh, tumors that we take care of. Um, the new headquarters at Levine Children's ties itself with the Levine Cancer Institute, which is one of the larger cancer institutes in the Southeast, um, allows us to have a little bit more bandwidth, obviously more patients with an um, improved international airport. We're incredibly excited um, to bring uh, the shoulder lab as well to um, Levine's and, and really going to talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing in that lab. Um, but 
into the talk and uh, treatment of high risk neuroblastoma, which obviously most uh, people in this audience understand uh, that it is a mixture of induction, consolidation, and uh, maintenance therapy. And so I won't go through this uh, too intently, but uh, combination chemotherapy, which is fairly aggressive, uh, of stem cells. Uh, in most centers in the country, uh, followed by surgery to resect most of the primary tumor, as well as followed by um, either a single transplant or a tandem transplant, and tandem is considered the standard of care, uh, followed by radiation therapy. And then I think with DFMO, um, hopefully we have a, um, a place in our therapies is um, in maintenance therapy with um, antibody as well as uh, retinoic acid. Uh, maintenance response, which uh, has been very well published um, from AMBL0032, a COG study. Um, these patients were uh, randomized to receive the antibody um, as well as this retinoic acid. Um, as you can see, the numbers there it was a really a pivotal trial uh, for the neuroblastoma community in improving um, event free survival and overall survival, as you can see there in the data. So, why DFMO and why do we think it's an important target? Um, you know, the reality of this is, is that it is um, in, because it blocks ornithine decarboxylase. We don't need to remember that, but it um, decreases polyamines. We know very well that in neuroblastoma stem cells, um, as well as in um, the cancer itself, that, that um, polyamines are overexpressed. And so um, logically, we would want to try and drop that um, and inhibit those. And we can see that inhibition of polyamines decreases in the urine as well with the use of DFMO. Um, it also reverses an incredibly important pathway called LIN28, which is uh, shown to be uh, uh, perturbed in many different cancer stem cells and different types of cancer. And also, as many of us know, make an amplification uh, portends a poor prognosis and, and, um, or makes you a high-risk patient at times. And so a DFMO also suppresses that. This is just a fancy picture to let you know that there is some uh, science and some pathway behind it. Now, this is really, I think, where the, at least when I started hearing about the DFMO story um, about 10 years ago, where I think a lot of our interest lies is the cancer stem cell. And so our uh, many uh, groups and labs and, and places across the world really looking at the cancer stem cell and understanding that after chemotherapy, that stem cell can still remain, even though we cannot capture that with any sort of MIBG, uh, CT scan, MRI. But we know that there's a population of stem cells that are there that always um, are present and can allow the patient to relapse. And so obviously that subpopulation is very, very important. And so these uh, cancer stem cells can self-renew. They can generate differentiated cells that um, can grow the original tumor again. And then unfortunately, the cancer stem cells has, uh, has been kind of shown in sarcomas, also in, in Dr. Scholler's uh, data for, for these stem cells is resistant to modern cancer treatments. And so you feel that you are uh, shrinking the tumor and improving it, but unfortunately you're leaving behind these cells. Uh, this uh, picture here is just to show um, you can have your tumor and then therapy. Obviously you can get tumor shrinkage and improvement, but unfortunately these cancer stem cells remain and then they turn into a relapse. And that is really the population of cells that uh, DFMO is trying to target. Uh, this is showing, uh, very elegantly done, has been um, readdressed also in the Scholler lab uh, from DFMO selectively killing uh, CD114 positive uh, cancer stem cells. Uh, just this graph, and I won't go too far into it, but uh, this just shows in a little red area, these stem cells uh, continue to decrease as you increase the amount of DFMO given in, um, obviously, in vitro in the lab. Um, and this is on two different neuroblastoma cell lines. And so exciting to be able to show that the FMO continues to inhibit um, these cancer stem cells, which is where the data for a DFMO and maintenance really evolved. Um, lots of slides and I apologize for, science, for the kind of uh, graphs, but I think they tell an important story is when you see two different cell lines here, um, the top and the bottom are just showing that once the FMO is added at very small concentrations, um, these dropping graphs just show you that um, you have cell kill uh, in vitro as well, and also in mice models, which is um, really the preclinical work that led to uh, the DFMO trial that we're going to talk about. And so that's kind of the science leading up to that and telling us that 
inhibiting polyamines as well with a drug that, as you will see, is incredibly well tolerated, um, is an exciting opportunity. So the DSMO is maintenance therapy. This therapy is after high risk therapy, as you can see here. And so really what it was, was based on the data from 032, uh, from COG and Dr. Hugh, uh, and uh, really showing us that after that time point, if you could get patients on this study with no evidence of disease for two year mark, the goal was to improve event-free survival or the chance that that child would relapse and then obviously improve overall survival at the two-year mark. The dose, as you can see there, is a low dose. We've upped that dose a little bit, which I'll show. And then there were two shuns or two different ways that you could get on the study, which was patients at the end of therapy, which I just described, or patients who had relapsed or become refractory to neuroblastoma, but then again were put back into remission. I apologize for all these slides, but I think that these are really kind of story of DFMO in maintenance therapy, um, recently published again um, uh, in 2020 for updated slide, uh, updated data um, out two and four years. And so I'll walk you through these a little bit just for importance is these are patients that are all comers. As you can tell, the event-free survival at 84% of years is pretty well maintained until the four-year mark, which is really what we are excited to see. Um, you know, with any intervention, you're worried that that effect may drop off and that patients would relapse after that therapy. And the data uh, shown here does show that we have uh, been able to maintain those uh, numbers throughout the therapy. Um, MICN amplified patients do as well as non-MICN amplified patients. As, you, as I noted, that polyamine emission is important in MICN, but it's also noted that we are affecting the cancer stem cell in non-MICN amplified patients where we think that this is. And then we are currently uh, working uh, with the Children's Oncology Group and comparing uh, the data from some of the BCC uh, sites as well um, with the patients that were enrolled on 0032 and then uh, went on to DFMO, which you can show there. The data seems um, about the same as well there in that population. So if you look at this, another slide, this one is very important because these are patients who had had their cancer come back and then uh, were started on DFMO. Obviously, these numbers, we would love to see them improved, but in patients that had relapse refractory neuroblastoma, uh, we've made a lot of headway. There have been uh, many clinical trials through the Children's Oncology Group, as well as other, other groups, and BCC included, that have started to kind of improve that needle of patients who have relapsed or become refractory to uh, keep them alive um, and not relapse. And you can tell that DFMO in that patient population, again, being in remission going into DFMO, uh, still showed a 50% uh, two-year event free survival and a little bit of a drop-off at the four-year mark, as you can see. Now, this is um, a really exciting uh, analysis that, we, the, that I just mentioned that we did publish, and this is uh, data showing uh, about 80 to 100 patients, depending on how you look at this data, um, treated with DFMO for maintenance therapy, um, as I mentioned. And this just shows, again, that the patients who did not receive DFMO and the patients who did receive DFMO do have a statistical significant change in their event-free survival as well as their survival, and you get those numbers there. Um, and obviously, that is what has gotten us excited. Um, and so, with that data, um, this is just another one showing a, kind of a similar finding. Uh, patients on MCN amplified, it's a little bit more dramatic in the MCN amplified patients. Um, as you can see, the data there um, is a little bit higher. Now, this is where I think kind of primarily this talk really is important to get out there is uh, we have been granted our BCC and uh, Dr. Scholler and a bunch of uh, people prior to Levine Children's Hospital were granted breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA in April of 2020. Uh, that's uh, incredibly important just because not many pediatric uh, drugs, especially for pediatric cancer, get to, to market. And so uh, as I mentioned, we are working uh, to directly compare data to the COG data, and I think that that hopefully will show that there is a survival benefit. So important notes for parents and patients who do want to go on this study. Um, it is open to children at the completion of antibody therapy. Um, the prior study was up to 120 days. Uh, now we have changed that. There's some data showing that uh, the faster you start it, the better those patients will do. The initial arm, as I showed, did show um, lower doses. We have changed that dose 
uh, to a little bit of a higher dose, as you can see there, still with limited side effects. And that is currently enrolling at all of each of the cancer sites. Um, so I think uh, most important, what are the common questions for DFMO? And uh, I have, uh, I should have shared that, but I have enrolled uh, probably around 20 to 25 patients prior to uh, BCC uh, being our, at our institution. Um, it is an incredibly well-tolerated drug. Patients really have very minimal side effects. It is, uh, it's a pill that's taken twice a day uh, for up to two years. Um, it can be crushed and combined in water, apple juice, lemonade, pudding, yogurt, anything but orange juice. And it is um, a little bit of a table of things that we cannot, should not, or you should eat in uh, uh, minimal amounts when you are on DFMO. It can be given by the NG or the G-tube. And really, honestly, the most common side effects for the patients that have been taking it is uh, either hair kind of arrest, meaning that their hair does not grow or that it thins a little bit. Um, uh, significant alopecia or hair loss has not been noted all of that much, but it does uh, improve once you stop the drug, which I think what makes this drug great is that once you actually stop the drug, all of the side effects go away. Um, diarrhea in the first few weeks to months um, definitely happens. And uh, not in all patients, but that was fairly quickly. And then really what um, concerns many people at higher doses of DFMO is hearing loss. Um, that is reversible. Um, and in comparison to some of the platinum drugs that neuroblastoma patients go, this is not just in high frequency, it's across all levels and the speech can be affected. So we take that incredibly seriously and check hearing a lot during the studies. Um, but it is, it is uh, immediately reversible after you hold the dose and if you um, drop the dose as well. Uh, that hearing loss usually does not come back. And so of note, uh, that's not noted here, just in my own experience, I've noted a little bit of runny nose um, that kind of starts a couple weeks after you start the doses um, and kind of persists throughout it. And so from a hearing perspective, we always wanna make sure that it's not um, fluid in your ear, but it is really hearing loss. Uh, so DFMO maintenance for relapse refractory neuroblastoma, a very important population, which I think anyone who takes care of neuroblastoma is trying to attack in many different ways. Um, this study um, is built on a phase one study that was done a while ago now with um, combination of DFMO with etoposide at standard dose there, 50 milligrams per meter squared. Um, in the original phase one um, study, there were 16 patients treated. Um, and three actually have a CR uh, or are fully in remission off of that study, which prompted the phase two study. Um, pretty impressive for a phase one study. And so as you can see here, we will be giving DFMO for two years and then the etoposide only for six months. Um, these are answering important questions for patients who have had refractory, um, I apologize, uh, refractory um, neuroblastoma um, and patients who unfortunately about 17 to 20% of patients in, in upfront therapy will have uh, refractory disease or progressive disease. And then ARM2 is patients who have previously relapsed and show no active disease at all, which is great. Um, and then ARM3 is subjects who still have disease but are uh, with minimal act or minimally active disease. So this is a, a study prior to the arrival at Levine Children's Hospital. And I think this is you know, an important question. It's difficult to answer. Um, but as I mentioned, a lot of patients, unfortunately, fail upfront therapy. And, you know, um, there are lots of opportunities to try. COG is trying some different modalities as well to try and get this uh, there in the Beach Childhood Cancer Consortium. Um, this is open at a few of their sites where, we're, where it's been trying to target the, the patient uh, tumor exactly, looking for specific uh, genetic alterations of the tumor. And so as you start your therapy, you get your first two cycles of induction, and then we add a targeted agent depending on um, the biopsy that we did up front, uh, evaluating a precision medicine strategy. And really the question was, can we do better obviously, and is it safe and feasible? And so uh, the first 20 patients have been evaluated with uh, no serious adverse with the addition of these, uh, a smattering of these four agents. Um, and uh, we still have to collect the data and, and, and review how well they did respond to that chemotherapy. And so this plan study also is asking the question of, well, if we wanna try and target the stem cells, can we actually do that with antibody and retinoic acid? And that part of the study is a randomization where half the patients will get DFMO antibody and retinoic acid and half the patients will not. 
um, but all patients uh, after that seven month period will get put on DFMO. And so really checking safety, uh, making sure that it's tolerated the DFMO and seeing if we can improve or lower that relapse after treatment rate. Um, this is just a pictorial of what that looks like. And so I won't go through, but um, you know, the, the differences I think here from other trials is that in consolidation, um, the center uh, that is running the study is allowed to choose a single transplant versus a tandem transplant. Other than that, um, it's fairly standard. And that's actually it. I wanted to leave enough time for pictures. These are two uh, patients that have been treated through uh, beach childhood cancer, um, just a cute picture to end on. And then I think really importantly, obviously Dr. Scholler, who started this consortium and has done a wonderful job. There are many, many people, and I'll be with Kyle being the moderator for this. I, I definitely want to give a, a big shout out to the Childhood Cancer Foundation. Uh, we really couldn't do any of this research without it. So to that, I'll turn it back to you, Kyle, and be happy to answer some questions. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Osterheld, for uh, talking about that. Uh, I know we have a lot of questions in here, so I will raise some of them and uh, let you let you talk about those. Uh, the first one from Jude Sibley. Hi, Jude. Is as the data is so positive with DFMO, when, if ever, will DFMO be used in Cyapin and Cog frontline therapy? That's a wonderful question. I mean, I I think right now. Um, the data, we have to really check that to check it in upfront therapy. I think that with most drugs, you try it in the relapse setting. When it comes back, you also try it in a setting where uh, the standard of care has been attempted and you're trying to improve upon that. I think if the data continues to uh, look as good as it does, and really important is to make sure that it keeps going. So the two-year mark, the four-year mark, the five-year mark, and make sure that that data looks great. And at that point, I think we would uh, strongly consider running some clinical trials um, to bring that to the upfront. And as, you, as many of you know, the COG has embarked on a very, very big study, which will take a while to complete with bringing MIBG up front, out positivity, and it's a, it's a really good trial uh, for high-risk neuroblastoma patients. So obviously, um, we would like that trial to complete and see what that data looks like before we would ever do that. Um, <clears throat> Christina wonders, would you recommend DFMO maintenance for an NMIC non-amplified child that has no evidence of disease? Is there any benefit for non-NMIC patients? Yeah, and I, I may have blown through that side, but I, I, we definitely are noting that even in our NMIC non-amplified patients, a very popular question since when you look at DFMO, it is about MIC and amplified patients and polyamine inhibition, though it does attack the cancer stem cells. So we do think there is value in N non-amplified patients. I can speak for for the many patients that I have put on, they're probably about 50-50 uh, and make amplified and then make non-amplified and have um, had some success with that even in the relapse setting with non-MIC uh, amplified patients. So yes, the answer is I would recommend DFMF population. Okay, great. Um, could you uh, just real quick stop sharing your screen so that we get to see you? Oh yeah, um, my apologies. No, 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 that's great. Um, Everybody likes to see more of your face. All right, I, I'm going to try and do this and not screw it up. <laughs> yeah, don't leave the the uh, meeting. Um, I'll wait on that. Hold on. I don't know why it's not. Let me get out of my. Uh, uh, there we go. Did I stop sharing? <laughs> Yeah, perfect. Yeah, we, we see you a little bit better now. Okay. Um, someone has asked, many of the parents are struggling with maintenance therapy choices. I know between uh, Sloan's vaccine and, and DFMO, those seem to be the two popular ones. They said, is there any way that BTC and Sloan could work together uh, on some kind of combined trial? And I, I think that's an interesting question. Yeah, it's a, it's a really hard question to answer. I think we, I think all of us in the pediatric oncology community work incredibly well together. Everyone has got their kind of opinions on what's going to work and what's not. And I've had patients, um, to be very honest, I uh, believe in the informed consent process. And so I offer everything at the end of maintenance. And so that includes uh, the Sloan Kettering vaccine. I've had many patients choose that and have done very, very well on it. Um, and so right now, just because it 
is hard to interpret the data with both drugs being given or patients being given. We have chosen to just give DFMO or just give vaccine. In the past, we did at BCC allow after vaccine to go on DFMO, but I think um, that limits some of that, the potential of, of knowing what works in that setting. I think my opinion on that is I do think that maintenance is important for neuroblastoma. And so I think many families that wrestle with the choice, I think um, I always practice the way that I would if it were one of my children. And I think that I would feel strongly that one of my, ch if, if that were to happen, I would want maintenance therapy. I hope that answers it. I think we do work together. I think as the you know science comes out, I think we're all excited about some of the things that Sloan is doing, the BCC is doing, CD is doing. I think at some point, all those hopefully will be combined, but it is nice to have options. Makes sense. Um, Vicky wants to know, <clears throat> how do you know if the patients who received DFMO may have been the patients who have, would have done well regardless, um, especially now with the fact that children are receiving immunotherapy as part of the first consolidation? Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question, which is asked a, a lot, actually, and I think it's an important question to answer. And so, you know, we have two data sets um, that we're looking at. So we look at all of the patients treated with high-risk neuroblastoma in the Beach Childhood, Beach Childhood Cancer Consortium. So that's called the historical data for BCC, as well as looking at some of the data for the Children's Oncology Group 0032 study, which is the landmark study for COG currently. And so I think looking at that information to make sure that you are not uh, teasing out the good responders that got the FMO that did better, but putting all patients together. When we do that, looking at the data specifically for the FDA, it is continuously showing that there is a about 10 to 15% improvement uh, with patients after uh, consolidation uh, or immunotherapy. And so we, we believe that we are trying to answer that question statistically. It's a very difficult statistical question to answer, um, but we've got really smart people on it, and um, the FDA really um, pushes you to really look at your data clearly, and we're working with the COG to see what their data looks like in comparison to those patients that were treated with the FMO with COG, and so that collaboration is ongoing currently. Okay, thanks. Um, Spiros asks, how critical are the nutritional restrictions during maintenance? Uh, do the banned foods interfere with the drug's efficacy? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, everyone has a little bit of a different take on that that treats these children. I think uh, the big one is not to give it in the restricted liquids. So orange juice being the one that give it there, it doesn't work very well. We know that. I think uh, it's really hard. Most of these patients are three, four, five years old. And so some of these things are bananas and, and simple things like that. And so I think uh, it is doing things in moderation like everything in life. And so I think that it's not a one size fits all. There are families who completely take away all foods. I think that's probably not needed, um, but I wouldn't eat the restricted foods every, every day, if that makes sense. And so I tell our patients, that you can have things in moderation, but definitely do not put it in orange juice. But all docs that put patients on DFMO, I think have a little differing opinions on that. And so some are a little bit more strict than others. Um, now that I have Dr. Scholler's ear every day, I have asked her the same question. And I think she thinks fairly similar to what I answered that everything in moderation is probably appropriate. Okay, yeah, I, I hear that question a lot. So let's, um, thanks for Better asking. Wait. Um, Carrie says they're scheduled to start DFMO at the end of the month, and if patients are not completely in remission, are there still options to enroll in the study? Um, after up, is that after upfront therapy? I apologize. Um, she doesn't say. She just says. Yeah. If, yeah. Because you have if. Yeah, there is an arm on, on the DFMO that would be with etoposide uh, for patients with disease right now. Uh, we are not giving single agent DFMO, but we are adding topicide to that. That's the newest trial that's come out of the consortium. But yes, there is um, that that patient would have an avenue to getting DFMO currently with a BCC trial. Um, great. Uh, then another one here is the dose escalation to 25 milligrams also for patients who are in remission before starting immunotherapy. According to the trial site, these patients will enroll to a different stratum. 
Uh, yeah, so that, that, that dose escalation is going to be, so patients who are, have no evidence of disease will still be at the thousand and the increased, um, that only population that will be at a thousand, every other patient will be at the 2,500 per meter squared. Um, one person wonders what happens after two years? How is the ODC1 pathway blocked after that? Why two years? You broke up a little bit there, but I think the question was what happens after two years? Right. Why is it two years? They, they say, how is the ODC1 pathway? Yeah, I think, uh, I think for me, uh, two years, you have to make a kind of line in the sand somewhere. And so that data was just showing that um, two years was kind of leukemia maintenance therapy. It used to be three for boys, two for girls. And now there's a two year mark. I think that seems to be fairly standard. And some of the other trials for sarcomas. It's a six month uh, maintenance period now. And so I think maintenance is going to be important. It's hard to know if it's a year is the important date or two. Um, the data unfortunately is on the two year mark because we, I think that I was not involved in that, but I think the thought was uh, more prolonged suppression of that cancer stem cell was going to improve. Okay, great. Um, and then someone says, I understand kids in second remission are now required to do six cycles of etoposide and DFMO before they can do DFMO alone. Generally, these kids have had a great deal of chemo already through the years, and they're curious why um, we'd advocate a child who's NED would have more chemo and toxicity. Yeah, it's a really, it's a, it's a fantastic question. Questions that were asked in the scientific of that study. Um, I think that the answer, simply put, is the data with DFMO alone was still fairly low at 45 to 50%, um, with some of the phase one data showing that etoposide improved uh, the reduction of that cancer stem cell as well as the active disease that the patient had. Uh, it made sense to try and improve that because we had already tried DFMO as a single agent. And the expectation with etoposide is that that hopefully, obviously that's the why you do the study is that that will improve uh, those patients that actually go into a full remission from that and then stay into a remission if they have no evidence of disease because we still think that that cancer stem cell is, is there. That's a great to know, but I, I think it was something difficult for a scientific review to, to decide upon and, and uh, went back and forth, but we felt the preliminary data was strong enough that etoposide was a good addition. Okay. Um, Helen is asking, when can we expect to see DFMO FDA approved. How is this process? Going? Uh, the process is going fantastic. Um, and so uh, I could spend probably two hours going through this as I have been involved with, um, since the beginning of the year with the recruitment of Dr. Schiller to my site. Um, I think it's going very, very well. Um, there's obviously looking at all of the statistics that need to be that need to be done, but breakthrough status was a big deal. Uh, and uh, we have another FDA meeting at the beginning of 2021. Unfortunately, you know, with the situation globally with the pandemic, things got slowed down a bit. And so um, no real timeline. All I can say is I think um, we're excited about the opportunity. We have a good company that has uh, bought into this uh, drug and believes that they can get it FDA approved. So we're really excited about that and, and, and really trying to bring that to patients uh, in a commercial way and off study would be great. So I think, you know, the optimist would say a year or two, the pessimist probably say two to three, but I think uh, we are optimists here and we're trying really hard to, for it to be quick because we believe it should get into the hands of our patients. Yeah, I've been uh, on that for a decade now. So it's been <laughs> a long journey. Uh, and I know everyone is ready to, to make that happen. Um, someone asks, is, is there any data on the current trial with chemo slash IT, I'm not sure what that is, and DFMO as it relates to success? Um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I mean, I think uh, that I'm assuming they're referring to the new COG study with uh, randomization of IT and antibody with DFMO, and that's a unfortunate, I, I don't have access to the COG study, and just it's fairly new. Um, it's an exciting study, though, um, to add DFMO to that regimen, which as many people who treat uh, neuroblastoma have realized that that's a very good way to get our patients back into remission. And so, um, but no, I do not have that data, but I'm excited to see what that data shows. Oh, Reno Tekin, okay. Um, <clears throat> how many 
have been randomized so far on the antibody plus or minus DFMO portion? Is a question. Um, that is a, I asked the question and, and please don't quote me on this, but it's roughly about 100 patients have been enrolled on that study. About 85 to, to, to 100. I, I don't know, unfortunately, enrollments kind of come in, in batches, but a, a sizable portion, about 85 to, to 90 patients, and maybe a smidge more. Okay, great. Just a couple left here at the moment. Um, Spiros also asks, are you taking into account the Australian research that combines novel polyamine blockers with DFMO, uh, like AMXT-1501, and would this trial be enriched with new agents eventually? Great question. I think uh, we always have to keep an eye out for, for stronger poly inhibitors, and I think that um, I don't know that data offhand, but I think that we are always looking to see if adding a different agent is, is better or worse. There are definitely um, agents that are continuously coming out for other diseases that are, are improving upon the original. And so it's something to look at, but um, currently we, we, we're not working with the Australians, and, um, but definitely something to uh, consider. Um, okay, only one left on here. So anyone else, uh, we do have a few minutes left. So if there's other questions, please type them in. Um, I will read this last question that we have for now. Um, this person was told they'd be enrolled into stratum two. They were treated by MSK and not COG. Um, but they'd like to enroll into the arm receiving the higher dose and want to know if that's possible. Hard to answer on the conference. Uh, I would say we'd have to see where the, how that patient did and where they are and everything else. The, you know, my email is readily available on the BCC site. You're more than welcome to email me with some of the specifics and I can speak with Dr. Scholler and myself and we could kind of give you an answer, but hard to answer on a conference. There are some uh, pretty specific rules to who gets uh, onto which. That makes sense. Okay, um, one, one last question just popped in here then. Uh, a question about the recent paper results. When broken down to NMIC amplified or non-amplified, the data do not show statistical significance. Is there any comment on that? Is it because of the small number of patients? Uh, it's uh, another great question. Um, I think small numbers, I think some of the data is still being analyzed. I think that hopefully that was preliminary data that was published and so um, I think uh, we have noted that um, the survival curve does benefit, and so some of the statistics are very complicated because of the of the small number of patients. And so our hope is to be able to show that that, that shows cancer stem cells. But that's why you do the statistical analysis, and we're really just uh, kind of delving into that for the FDA as well right now. Great um, question. Though. Yeah, can, can children elect to join the maintenance portion of the antibody plus and minus DFMO without enrolling on the beginning of plan? 100%, um, that is actually what we're pushing really aggressively now just because we have met the end point or about to meet the end point for the first part of that study and that's called part B of that study. And uh, um, to be honest at our site, that's what we're doing uh, for patients who did not wanna be on plan. Um, we offered COG and plan and let and, uh, patients elect both at times, and so, uh, or I mean, elect one or the other. And so many of our patients uh, would like to have the FMO randomization that is built into the study. Um, <clears throat> does Levine welcome international patients? What's the capacity and volume there? Well, that is a wonderful question. Um, uh, yes, we do. We actually uh, have a uh, wonderful group called Global Health Services. Um, uh, like I mentioned, we have been the home institution since July and have seen about 20 international patients. Uh, obviously, with COVID numbers increasing, uh, the borders are starting to close again. So that is the biggest restriction currently. Uh, once that restriction is lifted, we do not have any of that. We have seen patients from uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, um, Australia, South Africa, um, UK, uh, so far, first you know, six months of, of, of housing the um, uh, the consortium. So we're really excited about that. Global Health is wonderful. They work with our families to make sure that uh, the finances are set, that uh, patients are um, brought to our institution, have concierge services. They will pick you up at the airport. They will bring you to our clinic. Um, it's incredibly stressful. We have housing set up for you. Um, and so it's an incredibly streamlined um, 
wonderful thing in Charlotte is uh, the second second busiest uh, airport in the country. So uh, flights are mostly direct from everywhere. So we're excited about that. And um, uh, we have uh, increased our volume significantly. I think people like Charlotte International more than Grand Rapids. Uh, I know it's easier for me to get there. That was that um, was a joke for all the, all the Grand Rapids people. We love Grand Rapids, but <laughs> easier to get to Charlotte. That's true. Uh, this is an interesting one from Laura. Why, in your opinion, are international specialists skeptical of DFMO? Uh, to, I don't exactly know how to answer it. I mean, it's hard to get into the brain of all those people, but I think, um, you know, if you look at the data, um, obviously this uh, community doesn't know me very well, but I am incredibly skeptical as well. And so um, Kyle knows that probably, but I think that the reality of that is once you take care of these patients and you put patient FMO, and so I've been taking care of about some patients for a really long time. Um, and so to see those patients who uh, historically would not have survived or on DFMO and are surviving. Um, it's kind of a testament to that. And I think that you're skeptical until you see the data, right? We're science the first and uh, I'm going to be skeptical about uh, DFMO making a change outside of five to 10 years to make sure that we see that. Everyone is taught as an oncologist that that's what you need to see. And so I hope, uh, you know, for our patients specifically that the data holds and that we see improvements, you know, um, if you look at any clinical trial that has uh, really robust data, the first couple of years, a lot of those studies look great. And then unfortunately, over time, patients relapse and succumb to their disease. And so I think we're trying to be cautious that that is not occurring in DFMO. And then obviously, the commentary out there that, and someone already asked this, are, are, are the patients on DFMO the better patients, right? Are DFMO patients the ones that... Um, would have survived regardless. And I think that our data hopefully will prove uh, to the community that that's not really true and that all patients are in that data set. But the numbers are small, so easy to be skeptical. Um, but I do think as the numbers grow, I think this uh, data will hold. Uh, that, is, that, is, that is great. I'm getting a message here. Um, let's see here. Uh, uh, Donna says, just thank you. This is an excellent presentation. Uh, she really appreciates your time, so that's nice. Thanks, Donna. Thank you very much. Uh, and then uh, I guess we've got just a couple minutes left. So uh, Kelly wants to know, how do you measure remaining cancer stem cells? Uh, that, is, uh, that is a great question because we are trying hard in all different diseases to find that. Some people are looking at it in blood. It's, uh, you know, circulating DNA and things like that in our sarcoma populations, as well as neuroblastoma. Um, right now, it's a blood analysis, but it is not there. I don't think there's any that have been fully accurate and that you could hang your hat on 100%. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, all right, tech net, I'm seeing from the tech people, uh, we can get back to these unanswered questions, but there's only one left, so I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, do we really need a randomized study in order to appreciate how good DFMO is? Don't we already know the survival rates from the frontline therapies? Uh, wonderful question. Um, I think that if you are a diehard DFMO believer, you would agree that no, we don't need a randomized study. But uh, in, uh, in, in any good clinical trial, randomization is the gold standard. Do I think that based on historical control, we need a randomized trial? I think it's uh, yet to be seen, but my, my take on it is I think we likely don't need a randomized study. Um, that'll be an important question for the FDA for approval. And I think uh, we're having those conversations uh, currently. It's a very good question. I think there's a lot of people who feel we don't. Right. Um, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Osterheld, for um, walking us through all that, for being here. Um, thank you to everybody who watched and um, sent in questions. There was a lot of questions and it's great. I, I wish that I was able to be with you all in person, but hopefully next year we will we'll make that happen again. Um, that's the end of this session. Next up, we will have the bivalent uh, vaccine studies. So head over to the Watch Live page on the event website. Um, and as Dr. Osterheld said, his email is readily available on research.bcc.org. Um, so you are welcome to email him. Any other questions, I know he loves to receive those. 
Uh, and then remember, if you do miss a session or any of the sessions that have happened up until today um, and the, the other ones happening, they will be available to watch shortly after the live session uh, on the on-demand on demand page on the event website. So check that out and uh, hope the rest of everyone's days are well. And thanks for, thanks for being here. Thanks a lot. All right.